makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter. And here's what's coming up on today's program. The euro falls to its weakest level in five months on expectations that the ECB will cut rates in June, with the Fed waiting until later the year. While we discuss the outlook for fixed income with PIMCO's chief investment officer for core strategies, Mohit Mittal. Apple is preparing to overhaul its entire Mac line with the new family of in-house processors designed to highlight artificial intelligence. Plus, Wall Street bank earnings in focus with J.P. Morgan City and Wells Fargo all set to report today. So first thing is first, so we've had a busy old week when it comes to treasuries and market movement. So let's take a look at the European market snap. Now, European stocks mostly rising. Actually, they're rising the most in three weeks. Again, there's a lot of tensions in the Middle East pushing commodities higher. We also have the prospect of euro area interest rate cuts, boosting sectors that are sensitive to borrowing costs. Now, let's look at the wider story. First of all, we do have a bit of breaking news on the IEA. That goes back to, for example, the oil story, Brent climbing above $90 a barrel. Again, traders watching how Iran might respond to this deadly attack on its diplomatic compound in Syria last week. Uh, we also have reports from the IEA predicting slower global oil demand growth this year and next. Now, that's, of course, uh, hitting not only Brent, but WTI as well. The other things we're watching out for, as always, the 10-year yield on watch, on big watch, uh, that yield falling four basis points, retracing some of the 22 basis point surge in the previous two sessions. The other thing I'm looking at, of course, is gold hitting a net record near $2,400 an ounce. In general, base metals actually extending this rally on increased supply risks and improving outlook for demand. Now, money markets sticking to wagers at the ECB will deliver a quarter point cut in June. This after a hot inflation reading from the U.S. on Wednesday that spurred a major repricing in markets. Now, let's bring Moed Mittal. He's a chief investment officer, of course, strategist at PIMCO. Moed, first of all, congratulations. You've made it to Friday. You must have had quite a week with everything that, w that we've found in bonds. Is there more to go in the bond correction? Thanks, Francine. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I think this has been a quite a busy week uh, with the U.S. CPI data coming above expectations. Uh, I think what this means for the bond markets is uh, bond markets have repriced the outlook for rate cuts. In the U.S., uh, at the beginning of the year, markets were pricing in close to six uh, rate cuts for this year. Uh, that seemed uh, you know, a little bit excessive to us uh, at the beginning of the year. What, where we are now, uh, we are pricing in closer to two rate cuts uh, uh, for this year. That looks closer to fair. Similarly, on the uh, ECB side, we are now pricing in closer to three rate cuts this year. That again looks closer to fair, given our expectations that inflation in the Eurozone uh, will come closer to 2% by the end of this year. I think in that backdrop, now that the market pricing has uh, adjusted to reflect what we would think kind of expected path of rate cuts, bond market is looking quite attractive. Uh, there's a scenario where the central banks yep. uh, don't have to deliver as many cuts if inflation continues to come in above expectations. But generally, given the cheapness, bond market is starting to look quite attractive. But, uh, uh, Moet, I mean, in a week when traders bet on fewer and slower interest rate cuts globally, you're absolutely right that the European Central Bank really you know, stood out and bucked the trend. But the hawkish policy from U.S. really poses a challenge for policymakers, including the ECB, does it not? I think uh, not, not as much. I think, uh, you know, post-pandemic, uh, what we saw was a global surge in inflation. Central banks across the globe uh, hiked rates in a coordinated manner to address those inflationary pressures. Where we are now, uh, we are likely going to see a little more divergence in the trajectory of inflation. And given that divergence in the trajectory of inflation, central bank policies can also diverge. So in that scenario, you could see ECB uh, deliver cuts when the Fed uh, does not, or even at the, or even ECB can deliver cuts at a pace that is somewhat uh, faster than the Fed, because of the differences in the inflation trajectory in the eurozone versus the U.S. So, Mohit, what is exactly the right way to play this ECB Fed divergence? And actually, I, I know you were making the case also for owning Treasuries, but what's the the case against it? Yeah, I think the case against it uh, would be just if uh, the inflationary pressures persist uh, in the U.S. It, it, it can certainly happen. I think uh, for now we are modeling closer to 3.5% inflation in the U.S. by the end of the year. 
if that happens, uh, Fed funds at uh, you know five and a half percent still look high relative to longer date, longer term neutral. So central banks can still cut uh, rates uh, even if inflation is above central bank's target. Um, but uh, you know if we start to see more reemergence in inflation, particularly on the service side, that could lead uh, to a little bit more weakness in the treasury markets. On the ECB side. I think uh, there is a little more divergence in the data. Uh, you can see from the inflation trajectory, uh, likely by the end of this year, inflation in the Eurozone would be closer to 2%, and that should give uh, ECB the confidence to deliver cuts. Now, if the incoming inflation and the, uh, and the wage data comes out stronger than forecasted, then the ECB may not need to deliver those cuts. And the way to is play the that Euro would to be par- just yeah. you know, a little... Sorry, Mike. Sorry. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. No, no, please finish. I was just going to say to your, to your question on how to participate in that, uh, I think uh, from a bond market perspective, global uh, uh, bonds start to look attractive. Uh, you know, opportunities in the Eurozone, opportunities in UK, even Australia or Canada, that start to look attractive at the margin versus the US treasuries. Mm-hmm. Well, does the euro head to parity? Uh, I think it's a possibility, uh, you know, if inflation in the U.S. stays somewhat stronger, which keeps the U.S. Fed, uh, you know, somewhat more elevated as far as rates are concerned relative to the ECB, you could see some further weakness uh, in the euro. Now, I think uh, the ECB, what ECB would focus on is the inflation effects uh, of uh, some weakness in the euro, uh, in the euro currency. Uh, and that, you know, another 6-7% weakness in euro doesn't necessarily change the inflation outlook in a meaningful manner. I think the other area where ECB would continue to focus on is kind of the commodity prices, if that start to flow into inflation. Uh, But certainly a scenario where uh, uh, euro currency weakens further versus the dollar. What's the most contrarian thing that, that you would buy right now? Uh, I think uh, there are a few contrarian things I would think of. I think first is uh, just the broad fixed income. Uh, I think uh, people have had negative returns for the last couple of years, or at least in 2022, 2023 uh, was strong. uh, But in 2024, year to date, uh, you know, you have seen uh, somewhat negative returns in fixed income relative to uh, equities. Uh, So the contrarian trade here is to own higher quality fixed income, where investors can get uh, 6.5% to 8.5% yields under most states, uh, they will realize that yield over the next one to three years, given the high quality nature of that fixed income. Uh, and then in a scenario, like a, to me, the cherry on the top uh, would be a scenario where any of the risk scenarios materialize, meaning growth comes out weaker than mm-hmm. expected. Uh, and in that event, uh, you could see double digit uh, returns on global fixed income markets. So at this point, uh, you know, increasing allocation to global fixed income certainly seems like a little bit of a contrarian uh, view. Mohit, thank you so much. Mohit Mittal there, the Chief Investment Officer. Core strategist at PIMCO stays with us. Because coming up, the UK economy grew for a second month in February, so we'll discuss that and the upcoming BOE report from Ben Bernanke. That's coming up shortly, and this is Bloomberg. Well, it's a bit kind of arrogant to say that the market is wrong, because what is the market? The market is the total IQ of all the people in the world, right? So uh, so that's a tough one. I do, I do think that inflation will be tough to get down. There is more nearshoring. Uh, we are seeing some, uh, we, well, we have recently seen some, some more pressure on, on raw materials. Uh, wage increases uh, are quite high. So I suspect that we won't see the type of rate cuts that many people expect. And that reprices everything, including your investments? Well, that's what you would have thought, right? But um, markets have been relatively resilient on the back of uh, changed uh, interest rate expectations. Um, That's been a bit surprising to me. But is that because they still believe it's a cut where actually we could see a hike? Uh, Partly that. What do you see? I mean, there's this, this U.S. exceptionalism, which is what we're seeing in the U.S. economy, the inflation data, what the Fed does. What have we gotten wrong on the U.S. economy? Well, the U.S. economy is actually 
pretty good, certainly relative to Europe, right? Um, and we see it as well. When I'm when I have when I see U.S. CEOs, they are just seeing the uh, the backdrop for doing business in America is so much better than uh, than doing business in in Europe. So uh, um, a lot of things are going right in America. Well, that was Nikolai Tangen, the chief executive of Norges Bank Investment Management, speaking exclusively to us for an upcoming episode of Leaders with Like What Goes Green. Now, we are keeping an eye, of course, on a lot of these base metals extending their rally. We just saw zinc this morning spiking again on rising supply risks. Moments ago, the LME copper also rising to the highest since June 2022. And we've hit an all-time record for gold. On to the UK economy, growing for a second month in February, suggesting a recovery from recession is now underway. Now, the data comes as the former Fed chair, Ben Bernanke, is set to release his report on forecasting practices at the Bank of England. Now, on all of this, let's get more with Anna Andrade from Bloomberg Economics and to talk about how you play the markets, Mohit Mittal from PIMCO. So, Mohit, thanks so much for sticking around and I welcome to the program. So, where's the UK economy right now? So this morning we had good news from the GDP data, a second month of growth. And actually the most interesting bit was that January GDP data was revised up. Uh, and so bring, bring together those two data points and that leaves the economy on track to grow by 0.4% at the start of the year, so in the first quarter. And that is just really shows that the economy has turned the corner from the recession. I think now the question is, does this mean that the UK economy is shifting to a higher growth economy for the rest of the year or not? We actually are a bit more skeptical so far we think it just sort of reflects more of a mechanical rebound mm -hmm. and that uh, growth rates in the area of 0.2% are what we're going to expect for the rest of the year, which is good. It means that the economy will recover um, based on you know, falling energy prices, re recovering in real incomes, but it will be sort of a subdued recovery. So for the Bank of England, it won't create that many concerns around whether it will derail the progress made so far on inflation. So Anna, what's Bloomberg Economics' view on actually how many cuts we're going to get? And we're, when? <laughs> we're still, we still keep the same view. So we think June is the likely uh, starting point for rate cuts. We just see it will be very, we just think it will be very hard for the BOE not to cut rates when you do have inflation at 2%, below 2%, set to stay around that target for the, for the, um, for the uh, coming months. So we think it will be very hard for the BOE um, not, not to cut. And, uh, you know, we'd blurb, we have CPI data next week, and, and that will probably still show that, um, you know, June um, is the most likely. Uh, Mohit, we were talking, uh, of course, about the divergence between the Fed and the ECB. I mean, c can the BOE actually cut rates before the Fed? Again, this gravitational pull, you know, fr from the Fed is not insignificant. Bank of England can cut rates even if the Fed doesn't. Uh, I think I uh, agree with what Anna said. Basically, you know, growth is picking up, but not going to be too high in the UK. Our view would be probably closer to about a half a percent real growth uh, by the end of the year, and then inflation near two and a half percent. So in that scenario, uh, certainly Bank of England can deliver uh, about two cuts uh, by the end of this year. Uh, Gilts, you know, broadly speaking, four and a quarter percent to four and a half percent across, you know, uh, five. Uh, to 10 year, 5 to 30 year maturities start to look uh, quite interesting, particularly also rec recognizing uh, a little more orthodox uh, fiscal policy post the events of September 2022. Uh, in, the, in, a event, in, in a scenario, this orthodox fiscal policy uh, continues, which it likely will, uh, irrespective of the election. Uh, I think uh, that would be supportive for gills uh, in, in the portfolios. But so, Mo, what is it? Are you buying gilts right now? And again, is, is there an attractiveness to the UK compared to other parts of the world? Yeah, I think uh, certainly we are increasing our exposure in gilts. Uh, you know, real growth around half a percent, maybe a little bit below that. Inflation around two and a half percent, maybe a little bit below that. So what you have is, uh, you know, gilt yields that are significantly higher or are expected to be higher than the nominal growth rate uh, of the economy. So that is supportive for gilts. Uh, also, unlike the U.S., you don't have a continuously higher fiscal deficits, which we are seeing in the U.S. So at the margin, there is uh, certainly increased attractiveness of gilts versus U.S. treasuries. Mm -hmm. um, we're also, and of course, expecting the Bernanke review, right? So it's coming out today with much anticipation. What are we looking for? I know we, we did a, a good preview yesterday, but does it make a difference on the, also on the back on, on this divergence on how traders could look at the BOE? Um, I think... 
It's important also to say what not to expect from the Bernanke <laughs> review. I think what Bernanke won't say is that the BOE had a forecasting problem. Um, the, we yeah. looked into this and the forecast errors from the BOE uh, were very similar to those of the Fed and of the ECB. So we think the, the Bernanke probably will deliver a verdict that, you know, there, there's nothing wrong, specifically wrong with the BOE. Where we think the core of its recommendations could lie is on the communication strategy mm -hmm. of the BOE. It has been sort of a long-standing issue that the BOE doesn't sort of communicate what's its mm -hmm. view on the rate paths. So we think one of the key recommendations could be uh, for the BOE to shift to produce its own interest rate path. It doesn't need to be something like the dot plot, mm -hmm. but it could be something more like the Riggs Bank, where the Riggs Bank publishes a forecast for interest rates based on a model, but also based on judgment. And uh, that will give us just more, more clarity in what the BOE is thinking, not only at this meeting, but sort of more in the medium term. Uh, and Mahud, I think final question for you. It was really interesting speaking to the head of the, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund yesterday, the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world. And, you know, there, there was, I guess, a question mark on whether inflation can really come down as we're expecting it. Larry Summers um, believes that we could see a hike from the Fed instead of a cut. Do you think this is a possibility, if not a probability? I think it's certainly a possibility. Uh, we would assign a little bit lower probability to it. I think uh, you know, inflation likely finishes the year around 3.5%, but to an extent uh, that inflation starts, starts to reemerge, uh, then there's a possibility that the Fed uh, hikes instead of uh, delivering any, any cuts. What we have seen is that inflation, uh, you know, bought, or inflation moved lower towards the end of the year to about 3.5% on three-month annualized basis. That number has picked up uh, towards 4.5% on a three-month annualized basis as of uh, quarter end this quarter. Um, and that would put the year-end inflation at around 3.5%. Uh, you know, but to an extent, uh, you know, we see inflation continue to move higher. There's a scenario where the Fed uh, can hike. Okay, thank you both for joining us. Mohit Mittal there from PIMCO and Anna Andrade from Bloomberg Economics. Now, coming up, Apple prepares to overhaul its entire Mac lineup with AI-focused chips made in-house. That story is next, and this is Bloomberg. This is arguably the single most important machine in the world right now, technologically, economically, and geopolitically. Without it, the global economy would slow, the pace of technological advancement would stutter. EV technology is the only reason that we have iPhones that are as fast as they are, the reason that we have this AI revolution with chatbots and ChatGPT. They cost $200 million each, and of the 200 or so that exist today, just a handful are on US soil. The device has turned the only company that produces it, the Dutch firm ASML, into Europe's biggest technology firm. And that's despite the fact that much of the early work on the technology originated in the US. What's more, successive US administrations have had to scramble to ensure that none are sold into China. This is a story about where physics meets business and has a massive impact on the world's economy. So how did the United States manage to miss out on this colossally important piece of tech? And subscribers can see the documentary in full on the terminal and Bloomberg.com. Now let's turn to Apple and Bloomberg understands that the company is preparing to overhaul the chips in the entire Mac lineup. For more on that scoop, let's bring in Robert Lee from Bloomberg Intelligence. So Robert, thank you for joining us. Do you think this refresh highlights Apple is on the AI offensive? Yeah, I think that's a very fair way of looking at it. Um, but I think it's a well-known view in the market that Apple's been a bit behind the curve when it comes to AI. And you've seen many of their PC competitors launched AI-enabled devices really from the tail end of last year, beginning of this. So, you know, if this news is confirmed, it shows that Apple's putting greater efforts into its AI-enabled devices with a view to launch uh, devices based on these new chips at the tail end of this year and into 2025. So what impact could the refresh ha have on earnings? I think, yes. Um, whilst this story is making headlines today, the reality is Apple's business is dominated by smartphones and, and obviously the iPhone, which accounts for over half their revenues. And as you've seen you know, in more recent months, and, and in fact probably for the best part of a year or more, 
um, Apple stock has been weighed down by concerns in their China smartphone business. So China smartphones accounts for roughly half their smartphone shipments overall. And given the you know, changing dynamics there with uh, local competitors like Huawei coming in and taking share, I think that's the focus for main investors going forward. Um, coming back to the uh, MacBook business, whilst their MacBooks are excellent, you know, it's, it's roughly 8% of their revenue. So even if, and I think my US colleagues put this the best way, even if we saw a 10% uplift to the MacBook sales, that would account for about 3 billion incremental revenue, whereas their iPhone shipments mm. this year, are, sorry, their iPhone sales this year are going to be around 205 billion. So 3 billion potential uplift as an illustration versus 205 billion. So I don't think so you know, it's going to really move the needle overall. Robert, thank you so much. Robert Lee there from Bloomberg Intelligence. Now, coming up, we'll be speaking to the managing director and chief executive of Tata Communications on their growth plans and AI plans. This is Bloomberg. The euro falls to its weakest level in five months on expectations the ECB will cut rates in June, with the Fed waiting until later in the year. Apple is preparing to overhaul its entire Mac line with a new family of in-house processors designed to highlight artificial intelligence. Plus, Wall Street bank earnings in focus with JP Morgan, City and Wells Fargo all set to report today. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now to Indian markets, where stocks are lower today, but still on course for their fourth consecutive weekly advance, backed by institutional investor purchases. Now, since the 22 or 2020 lows, India's Nifty 50 has soared almost 200 percent, really underpinned by megatrends like growing profit margins and broader market participation. Now, one Indian company that has seen a rally this year is Tata Communications up 55% in the last 12 months. Now, the firm is part of a sprawling Tata conglomerate, which straddles industries like cars, steels, software power, and much more. Now, I'm delighted to be joined by Amur Laksha Minarayan, the Managing Director and Chief Executive of Tata Communications. Lakshmi, thank you so much for joining us. Thank I mean, you. Thank you for having me. It's extremely interesting to understand through your eyes and how you see and how you're expecting Tata Communications to grow, where you also see growth opportunities in AI and what your customers are telling you. How will Tata Communications change in the next five years, thanks to AI? Um, our focus um, is to pivot the company to a digital fabric, uh, traditionally, we've come from a, a network background, so we, you know, our network um, is one of the most powerful in the world. Uh, we say that a third of the world's internet routes are published on our network. Uh, we are one of the biggest voice players as well. But on that platform, we are building the digital capabilities, um, and our digital fabric um, essentially is a network fabric, a cloud and edge, edge fabric, and we're going to be soon launching our own AI cloud. Um, the third fabric is Interaction Fabric, uh, is, which is a very interesting acquisition that we did last year. And the fourth is the IoT Fabric, uh, which we enable connected cars, uh, enable Adeline crews to be more productive with, their, with our Move platform and so on. So that's the digital fabric. Uh, and our aim and vision is to bring this digital fabric to enterprises, mm -hmm. to help them to uncomplicate things for them. And, and make sure the fabric can be more intelligent on which they can build their applications mm -hmm. to serve their customers. So that's our vision. Um, we see enormous fabric, potential. Yeah. I mean, the fabric is really what holds it all together. So it's the networks underlined with some of the things that you're, you're putting in place. That's right. How quickly will that adoption come to the next level? So incorporating some of the changes that you were talking about. Yeah. Yeah, already the you know, aspects of a fabric is uh, live in many customers. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at um, um, JLR, where we work extensively, mm -hmm. uh, we enable both the, uh, the network fabric for them. We also enable the connected vehicles uh, for them. Right? So our Move platform is enabling the connected cars. It gets cars get manufactured um, here in the UK or Europe. And when they sh uh, ship the cars to different countries, our platform is enable them, enabling them to connect to um, you know, multiple carriers around the world. And the intelligence really comes from the fact that uh, you know, through the fabric, we are able to, you know, the cars today are you know, full of software. And everybody has to uh, update the cars through over-the-air updates. Mm -hmm. 
worldwide, um, the OEMs uh, are wasting about $3.8 billion of money because of the failures in SOTA. And it's a huge big problem for the fleets and other people where yeah. you don't get the software update, then you have to go to a dealer, spend right. time and get that updated. Yeah. If you have an assured connectivity and we're able to give them the intelligence to say, what is the best window to push the, uh, the software update? That's an enormous benefit to any, uh, any car manufacturer. So that's the intelligence we bring. So that's a yeah. fabric on the IoT side. And similarly, on the network and making the factories more intelligent, we are enabling that fabric as well. But, Lakshmi, so, so you, and you lay it out very simply, right, the, the four drivers. Yeah. What will drive revenue and in what kind of time frame? So what's the next big thing that you're looking at? Is it exactly what you're it's, talking uh, about, it's, connectivity? It's all the four. It's all the four. So the network fabric is, uh, is an enormous opportunity. Um, you know, the, you know uh, network is something that many companies have taken for granted. Uh, now with the complexities of using internet, uh, with the complexities of people moving to cloud. And cloud certainly uh, was very helpful for people initially. Now, you know, it comes with its own baggage of cost and people are worried about the cost escalations in using the cloud. And especially when they're connecting to multiple cloud, the cloud networking itself is becoming complex. So our network fabric, so the new product that we have launched will enable our customers to say, how do you access cloud in the most uh, convenient way, mm -hmm. and it, you know, can you get the cost down by 20-30% in connecting and managing the cloud connectivity uh, across multiple countries. So our products are very, very focused on enabling the customers to really accelerate the digital journey yeah. and also at the same time to see how they can do it at a much reduced cost, and that's what we're addressing. So all the full um, fabric that we have, uh, we believe, has enormous potential to grow. Um, actually, if you look at the share price, they've been doing really well this year. If you look at the profits, I mean, it's actually slipped year on year. Yes. What, what have been the, the headwinds? And are you confident that things get better from now in terms of profit and revenue? Absolutely. No, this is, uh, you know, this has not happened by accident. This is by design. And I've been telling the markets that, uh, you know, we have, in the, in the first three, four years that I've been in the company, uh, we have got the balance sheet to a very healthy level. Um, we are very strong now. Our debt levels, uh, we got it down. Our profitability improved from a 16% to 24%. Uh, our ROSI went up from an 8% to upwards of 24%. So we got our you know, balance sheet right. Now, for us to grow the revenues, uh, it cannot come without investments. And we had to make those investments for the company to, to grow. So all the fabric that I'm talking about, so we invested organically in building those capabilities and platforms. In a couple of cases, uh, like media is a big business for us. Uh, so it's we, a fun business too. I can, it's a I fun can tell you that. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Love. So when I watch the races and actually when the team takes me behind the, behind the scenes to see how it all happens, it's very exciting. Uh, but there we invested in a company called Switch in the U.S. Yep. Um, they have you know, a great team. We have a cloud production facility in the West Coast, looks fabulous. Um, and, and we made another acquisition called Calera, yeah. uh, which is in the customer interaction business. So all these investments have been made, yeah. and, and they are partly the reason why you know, our margins came down. But we are very confident that in the next couple of years we'll be able to get the margins back to where, where it was. Well, actually, I mean, one of the most exciting things is also you're the lead partner to build the AI cloud with NVIDIA. I mean, this is a, a huge, huge deal. Can you share any update on the partnership? Have you had any milestones with them already? Yes. I mean, we are constantly engaging with NVIDIA. We're hugely excited about the partnership. Um, we are using the reference architecture so that we can get that started very quickly. Um, uh, we are also talking to many potential customers um, uh, to see how the usage of that would be. And we want to ensure that we offer a, a full platform, not just... Uh, a GPU uh, on rent basis, right? So we will offer a platform that will enable customers to properly bring the data, select the right models, uh, do all the version management of those, and do the training and fine tuning in a proper way, uh, because it's not as easy as it sounds. So we need the right expertise for, uh, to bring to play, which we are uh, confident of bringing. Uh, we have trained over a thousand people in the company on AI. Mm -hmm. um, so we are hugely excited, uh, we think, our customers would be able to leverage what we offer mm -hmm. uh, to their advancements because AI surely is going to change the way people do business.
But is that, are you expecting a big milestone to be announced soon? Is there something that, I mean, for the moment you're still working on how exactly it will play. Yes. Yeah. When will it be ready? Um, uh, <laughs> hopefully in the next couple of quarters we'll be live. Um, and yeah, it's a hugely exciting journey we're looking forward to. Um, actually, I mean, the other thing, and we were talking a little bit about, you, you know, Tatacom in India also, you know, um, hiving off its digital services into a separate company. Is that in view for an IPO or to, to, to like a proper spin-off or something like that? Not really. I think um, um, the way, you know, it is, it is purely to bring about certain efficiencies yeah. uh, in not just a, how it operates from no. tax and other reasons. So it's been, um, it's been spun off into a separate company where uh, these are products and services that we can deliver to the customers, yeah. which are not typically uh, telecom oriented. Right? So that is what so, we have done. So. Um, Lakshmi, you also have been in the UK for a week. Yes. I mean, how does it feel? Is it, are, you know, are you bringing more investment? I know you speak to a number of clients. Yeah. We've had a, a tough couple of years, I would say, in the yes. UK. Yeah. Is it now turning a corner? No, definitely. I think um, I've met lots of customers. Um, I think fundamentally, you know, this year, I know the environment is tough. You know, the, the consumers spend. You saw, I think the inflation is still not uh, relenting. So it's going to be um, tough. But customers are preparing themselves for the future, which means that they have to get their foundation right. Uh, this is the year we think uh, that when customers focus on saying, you know, let me get my foundational digital foundation right, which is your network, how you connect to cloud, and all of that, you know, if they can get it right, I'm sure it will help them to be prepared when, the, when things turn around. So they are quite optimistic about um, our customers and the prospects that we have with them. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you so much for joining us today. That Thanks was, of so course, much. Lakshmi Amor Lakshmi Rayanan, the Managing Director and Chief Executive of Tata Communications. Now, we'll have plenty more uh, coming up on The Pulse. We also have a great conversation lined up with venture capitalist Eric Collins, who invests in diverse entrepreneurs. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Welcome back, everyone. Now, my next guest is a leading venture capitalist who invests in diverse entrepreneurs and the author of We Don't Need Permission, How Black Business Can Change Our World. Now, his company, Impact X, invests in businesses founded by women and people of color, the demographic least likely to get VC backing. Now, Impact X also recently announced a key equity investment into its fund from Bank of America. Well, Eric Collins, Chief Executive of Impact X, joins us now. Eric, first of all, congratulations. I know you tirelessly work to make a huge difference in this world. Are you seeing change, real change? Thank you for having me, Francine. And yes, we are seeing very real change. If you look at the investment trends and sort of who organizations that are asset allocators are looking to, they're looking to organizations obviously that can return investment. That's you know, hygiene. Yeah. But then they're looking for further impact. And the kind of hypothesis that an organization like ImpactX is actually progressing in the world, and particularly focusing on digital technology, health education, well-being, and media and entertainment, where diverse people over index in terms of their participation, mm -hmm. what we're finding is that type of sort of doubling down in terms of the approach to looking at and then saying that there is value associated with is extremely helpful. So I am seeing more capital actually starting to evaluate. Now we want to make sure that those checks are being written into um, GPs and others. Because see, I mean, we're looking still at, at figures, I mean, between 2009 and 2019, and we have a whole team looking at some of these figures. In the UK, just around 40 black people received VC funding. Yeah. That's less than 0.4% of all funds allocated to founders. Mm -hmm. I mean, since 2019, is that changing, or is it, no? Those numbers are aren't changing. When, when we look at sort of fully, teams that are fully diverse, meaning that they are run by women, they are run by people of color, uh, we're finding that those numbers haven't changed tremendously. When we're finding teams that are then sort of more diverse themselves, right. so that they're women, men, black, white, yeah. Asian, then we're finding right. that there's increased attention to those organizations. So that actually is slightly increasing. The thing which is actually very much increasing is the focus on emerging managers. So emerging okay. managers who are dealing with impact. So put those two things together. We're looking at sort of the most disruptive sort of managers and 
then we're looking at the most disruptive space, and one which has a lot of tailwinds going along with it. Because if you're here in Europe or the UK, and increasingly in the United States, the idea that what you have to be able to deliver is not just return, but you have to be able to deliver an another yeah. tangible impact, which is measurable, is becoming much more important. So we are seeing that actually grow. But are we seeing actual capital and checks being written? We don't see that many Bank of Americas who are making these sort of catalytic investments. But we're... We, we tend to hope that that is going to get stronger and stronger. I mean, especially in the U.S., there's been a, a backlash against certain DNI initiatives. Do you see that in Europe and the U.K. as well? You know, being, uh, you can tell from my accent, I'm an American, so uh, I do not... I would have see, never said You would it. never have guessed. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see the same type of conversation that has been happening in Europe. Now, will there certainly be repercussions and fallout because many of these large organizations that are big American banks that obviously are responding in their local market and then have international activities, will we see something happen? Probably we'll see something happen. But there are other organizations. J.P. Morgan, for instance, has made it very clear through Jamie Dimon that they are doubling down in terms of their perception that the world that they see coming forward is one that has diverse people doing a number of things, and it's important to them to make sure that they are on the cutting edge of that trend. So there are organizations that actually believe that it's a differentiated strategy, not only for deal flow, but for returns. Who's best in class in terms of country for giving enough support for founders that need it most? The country. So at the country level in terms of, say, sovereign funds or the country level in terms of things like the British Business Bank, there are a number of places that I would actually mm -hmm. point to. I would say that in the UK, institutional investors that are associated with things like um, foundations mm -hmm. do fairly well. So we have the guys in St. Thomas's Health Foundation came into Impact X. But also in the United States, you have the Visa Foundation. So these are organizations which are actually utilizing an allocation from their endowment. And those endowments are important because that's yeah. where they do their grant funding. So they want the money back. It's not a grant for us. Mm -hmm. They want their money back at some multiple. So those organizations are saying that there's an opportunity here. And I do believe that most people who actually are taking care of their fiduciary responsibility and saying we need to get the highest return, mm -hmm need to look at two things, right? They need to look at, are we having differentiation? Meaning, is something happening that others are not doing? And if some, is someone seeing some signal where others are not testing and seeing that signal? And then do we actually have proof of that through track record? So organizations find then talking to ImpactX and my organization that you have both of those. Since 2018, we have been investing. Now we have about 33 companies in our portfolio and we have been able to show what is now most important, which is actually growing this idea of DPI, you know, returning, the uh, investments through so, proceeds so, to our investors. Uh, so, Eric, now that you have Bank of America, are you expecting other big banks to follow? Francine, I love that question. We hope, and that's one of the reasons why this announcement was so important and being on this television program is so important, to let people know that an organization with the signaling power of Bank of America, who is saying that on our balance sheet, one of the first investments we're doing in Europe is in a company called ImpactX. That GP is doing things that others aren't. So we hope that that is taken as a true signal of what could be and what will be. And that others who are their peers, that Bank of America's peers, others that are their colleagues will actually follow suit. So that is what we're expecting. So we expect this to be a momentum builder. And, and are you expecting it also change within the banks? So the, the banks, so helping through you to get the money where it needs to be, but also, um, I guess, encouraging incentivizing their portfolio managers to make a difference? I, well, certainly. That's a very good question. And certainly, Francine, we hope that what is going on is that it is not just the activities that are occurring with sort of the allocation of right. balance sheet capital to us, but that indeed in terms of other things, that there are then those same banks are requiring, like we do, those, who, those organizations that service us, that they actually right. maintain our same values, so that they have women and people of color in key decision-making roles, that it's not window dressing, and it's not performa, it's not performative activity, but that these are people who are truly incorporated into the activities. And at Bank of America, we found that. Bernie Mensa here in the UK, who runs international for Bank of America is a great example of a person who is enfranchised in that organization and catalytically making change. And so I think, it, I think that's the kind of bank which is happening. Eric, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. That was Eric Collins, Chief Executive of Impact X. Now, coming up, the biggest U.S. bank stocks soaring over the past six months. Can they actually maintain that momentum? That's one of the big questions. This earnings season we will preview some of the earnings from the big banks next. This is Bloomberg.
The conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, investors are gearing up for the first quarter earnings from the major U.S. banks with J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, and Citi reporting later today. Now, for more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Jenny Sorain, who's officially stopped sleeping in the last week just to prepare for these earnings. I mean, they're, you know, they're big companies. It's big earnings. It's important earnings. Uh, what do you expect from J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo? So I think with those guys, the main thing that investors are really keying in on is net interest income. So if you think back to our last earnings back in January, um, the big message was, you know, we expect we had a great year in 2023, but we expect that net interest income to come down quite a bit as the Fed cuts rates. Um, now that we're in this kind of stage of we might be higher for longer, um, we've pushed out those expectations that we get rate cuts till later this year. Um, that NII number, um, it should actually still look really good for the first quarter, but I think it just puts all of the more emphasis on outlook and kind of that, that um, I guess, tone that they want to take in terms of preparing investors for those eventual uh, cuts to come. Um, Jenny, on Citigroup, I mean, this is a different story just because of the massive restructuring that we're seeing at Citi. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. So they've just gone through a process of cutting about 5,000 jobs. So they started back in September, just wrapped that up at the end of March. So this will really be investors' first chance to kind of hear from CEO Jane Frazier about how that process went, what morale is like inside the firm, uh, when do they expect to actually see some of the efficiencies coming through that after making these job cuts. Um, so I think there will be lots of focus on kind of well, what's next. Are you expecting to have to do more from here? Um, or is this kind of steady state for now while you kind of work through all of the big changes that this, this company just went through? So uh, definitely a tough day uh, for CEO Jane Frazier. I'm sure she'll have a lot of explaining to do. Um, but it will be interesting to kind of see where they've landed after such a big change. Well, what about Morgan Stanley? I mean, this is all, Ted Pick's a fairly new chief executive. Yeah. So yesterday, you know, Morgan Stanley's stock was down a good bit because of a Wall Street Journal report um, that regulators are actually investigating the company over their any money laundering controls. Um, so you're exactly right. I think the fact that, you know, they're just a few months into a new CEO, it's probably not exactly what he was hoping to have on his plate so early. Um, but I do think investors will be really keen, usually with stuff like this, AML, regulatory concerns, that's not stuff that can be wrapped up quickly. Um, and it's usually pretty costly to remediate. So I think um, that would be kind of the big focus for them is, you know, is this something that's going to be a years long effort to fix um, or is there, you know, not a there there? Is this something that they try to kind of um, look beyond as, as the results come out next week? Jenny, thank you so much. As always, Jenny Serene, they're in charge of our banking coverage. Now, let's have a look at the markets. European stocks, first of all, actually rising the most in three weeks. Again, there's a lot of these simmering uh, Middle East tensions pushing commodities higher. The prospect of euro area interest rate cut also boosted, boosted sector sensitive to borrowing costs. You look at gold, record high, briefly, well, it's close to 2,400. Brent, 90.52. Again, traders watching how Iran might respond.